that a question to the speakers. Do you have any examples of cost and ROI that show how clients can uh, save money in the in the long run? And, and, and that would be very helpful when deciding on implementing a digital strategy. So does anyone have um, anything from the audience, so some uh, reference they would like to make here? Or, or what we could do is if we don't have one right away, we can, uh, we can send uh, some answers in an email after. Anyone want to take this one? A lot of silence there. <laughs> um, so I guess from my perspective, I think there's a lot of case studies on uh, introducing BIM and BIM programs in LIDAR. There's probably a lot fewer uh, published articles on 360 imagery for uh, creating uh, efficiencies in the workplace. Uh, we are working on some of those specific case studies right now. Sam, have you used anything in the past here on, on ROI from 3D and, and justifying uh, uh, rolling out a program? Um. Not 100% for the program, but I mean, we do, we have plenty of ROI of, of, of uh, photogrammetry versus laser scanning. Okay. Uh, specifically, uh, you know, we, at AECOM, we're in a unique position where we are, we also have, con, we also are owners of construction firms, uh, Hunt Construction, Tishman Construction, and Chimney. Um, so there have been several occasions where we've had to uh, bring uh, the LIDAR into the equation uh, to justify uh, costs and things of that nature. Um, so it, it does exist. And, you know, I mean, I think that the ROI, so there's ROI is such an interesting term, right? <laughs> a lot of different ways to measure ROI. Is it, is it like, uh, are we talking net margin uh, ROI or are we talking new business ROI? You know, there's right. so many. I mean, is, is, is this a part of doing business? Is this additional to doing business? Did this uh, allow you to increase your, uh, your, or decrease your labor while maintaining the same cost? I mean, that's, that, that's ROI in my opinion. Uh, so there's, there are a ton of use cases that you can use, none of which I'm willing to share with anyone. Kidding. <laughs> That's a bit of a, an IP thing too, I get. But I think what you, you gleaned is some very good perspective there. And I think the perspective is that there's many ways to look at savings, ROI. You know, Kelly will have a very different uh, view on what ROI means. Like, what is the ROI of, of IP being stolen from your organization, right? What is, uh, you know, a good security posture? What is that going to mean to your organization? Jennifer will have a different perspective here. So I, th I think the key is asking the customer what's important to them, asking them what processes are painful, what, what is the looking at time and cost, and, and then just kind of calculating, well, if we do it this way versus that way, uh, where are the savings? What is, what is critical to the organization? Because you know some organizations don't care about the time. They got the ABER, they're, they're going to do it. So time might not be a factor, but you know something else might be really important to them. I, th I think the ROI does it is driven by the um, by the owner. Anyone else like to come on on this? Yeah, we go? yeah, yeah. Kelly, I, I just yeah, I want to thank Sam for jumping in first. <laughs> but <laughs> no, what, what he said is true. It, it ROI is nebulous, right? I mean, it, it's. Uh, what I, what I can comment from our side is, is that there is ROI, but it's very esoteric because you'd have to break down exactly what, uh, you know, how, how many, how many crews would you normally take to, to uh, achieve the task that you're trying to achieve, but then now you've replaced X number of those man hours now with technology. And that's really the, the thing that we face all the time because the industry right now has got a huge you know, it's kind of like the old battle between good and evil. Well, now you have human capital versus technology and it's, exactly, yeah. it's going through all of our companies right now. And so it's, you know, we're going to be replacing man hours with, with technology. And obviously technology is going to generally be far more efficient, but then again, there's a cost to initially, you know, the capex of bringing in that technology. So that's something that isn't going to be realized right away, but over time, uh, it, it's, you're, you're going to have ROI because you're going to have more efficient ways of capturing data and you're going to reduce that number of man hours, which is also reduced in insurance liability with, yep. you know, there, there, there's so many cost factors involved, but so to just break out a simple ROI case uh, is it, difficult, but it, 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 it's, it's there. It's, it's real. It's, it's not pie in the sky, but as I yep. said, it's very esoteric because you have to really break it down to a lot of different areas and then a lot of those areas are going to branch into a lot of different sections of your company. Just like, you know, you know, how, how do you pay an employee? You don't just give them a check. You've got a lot of different things going on. You've got HR, you've got, you know, you've got benefits, you've got 401k, you've got a lot of things. So all those kind of facets go into when technology comes in and starts to replace manpower, 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, you're going to have ROI, but it's 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 not going to be just real real clear exactly how you quantify it right away. Yeah, and I think that really also bleeds into the type of technology that we choose and what our needs are. What do we absolutely need to get from the project? If it is uh, accurate, accuracy is really critical, then you know, you're going to have more of a LiDAR application. So your barriers to entry are going to be much higher with the capital expenditures and the training and the expertise. Um, so it's like, do you do that internally? Do you sub it out and work with a, an AECOM or a, a precision aerial? Um, when we get into 360 imagery, um, the barriers are a little less, right? We, we're not buying, uh, you know, regal dr- birds like you are, um, <laughs> Scott. Yeah, where it's a pretty yeah. heavy investment. I mean, your your, your house right there. Your, your McLaren's big... in the sky. <laughs> right, right, exactly. McLaren's <laughs> in the sky. I like that. So, yeah. you know, I think the 360 imagery has a, a, a really um, – an interesting way to kind of democratize that ability to to go after 360 capture to implement it, whereas some of the others have been a little bit di- a little bit more difficult. Now that's changing too. It's definitely in the lidar is changing. I think Sam could could validate that too from a, a slam perspective and, and what drones have really done with the world too is a, just a massive capture so quickly. Is you know we do have different technologies. There's a bit of a capital expenditure, but still we are capturing that data really quickly now. So there, there's a lot of nuances here, and I think. Uh, I think we're, we're kind of diving in. It's, it's complicated. ROI is I'll complicated. Give you, I'll give you a, a quick example that I usually, uh, just to try and explain, uh, you know, just how disruptive it is. But if you look at your classic four to 500 acre undeveloped construction site, uh, we'll use East Texas, heavy foliage, a lot of pine trees. Um, generally, we're looking at 30 to 45 days for survey to go out there and do one foot contour topo. Um, we go out and capture that data in one day. And then we'll use probably two or three days of... Uh, QC, where we'll use regular RPLS to go out and do our check shots, and we import that to QC the LiDAR data. But, you know, generally, we, we will have delivered that one-foot topo within uh, seven to ten working days. And, you know, generally, that crew would be out there for another three weeks just collecting the data. So it gives you an idea of how disruptive this technology is. Absolutely. If, if I can enter in, I mean, the one piece I always put, I teach a class on project management, and it's process orientation if you look at it to some degree. And I agree with Sam and, and Scott hit it spot on. Um, the biggest thing I look at, and for example purpose, if you want to look as a case study, this is a complex WBS. So it's a whole complete work breakdown structure and how do you deal with that entire process of assigning the tasks as well as what the, the money expenditure is on that. Now, given that's a little bit simplistic, but at the same time, you're dealing with all the factors that you have to deal with with regard to whoever's whatever trades are going to be involved with whatever build you're going to do. Um, but it, it's an interesting case study because I bring up something. So like take, for example, the, the, the um, big dig up in Boston, if this stuff was used back then to do that, I mean, the amount of savings and the amount of time frame, despite the politics, I think would have been huge. Right. Jennifer, you want to crack at this? We, we hit it pretty hard or, or we um, feel free to chime in if you like. I think that there's been a lot of good things said. Um, so it's hard to build upon that. And given what we've got, I don't know if you want to move on to any other questions before we get down to the end. Uh, we're going to, we do have a few more questions. I, I think we're, we're definitely 10 over, but um, if we don't get all the questions, we'll answer them by email. Uh, questions to Sam at AECOM. Uh, from the AE's perspective, do you see LIDAR more in the build and design and 360 more in the operate maintain? Or, or, or not, um, you know, kind of where do you see that looking at those um, construction phases versus the uh, uh, facility management faci- uh, side of things? Uh, I see LIDAR in both, um, yep. especially now that you've got the more slam based LIDAR. Yep. Uh, the fact that you have uh, asset tagging uh, capabilities uh, with a visual plan um, type program. Um, so I, I, I will say this, that I think historically it's been much more, uh, 360 camera on the, uh, operations and maintenance side, but I do see a change in that. I see a lot of change in it cause I'm doing it. Um, but the, uh, I, I would say that traditionally right now, it's still going to be more of a 360 image and that's okay. Right. That is okay. I'm a light art guy, but I, you know, I'll admit that's okay. Um, <laughs> Now it's uh, we are starting to make that change because what it does is is we can go through so quickly now, uh, not quite as fast maybe as the uh, the image, um, but then and also at the end of the day it depends on what you're going to do with it. The one thing that we always uh, try and measure uh, with anything that we do, even facility 
uh, operation maintenance type thing is, is what are, what are they going to do with what we give over uh, or what we hand over? You know, what could that possibly be used for? How can that be caveated? Um, because, you know, if we, if we go through and, and use just imagery and then create a model, a 3D model out of that imagery, well, what is somebody going to do with that 3D models in 10 years when they've forgotten that that was done or, or, no, one, or, or no one ever told them that that was done with 360 Im imagery, right? So um, we really have to, uh, we really have to think about it. But yeah, historically, it's, it's more imagery based, um, though we do see that changing. And I think, I think uh, you know, what's interesting from my perspective is, you know, imagery is allowing us to do things that we may have been using LiDAR for, but it may not have been the right tool. And it allows us to put our LiDAR budget into things that we really need to LiDAR, right? So I think, you know, we could probably see more uh, LiDAR being done as a result of photo photogrammetry, just simply because our budgets are used a lot more wisely over a project. Um, it's not like I'm going to laser scan a huge facility once a week but maybe I can have milestones where I'm laser scanning and I do 360 imagery in between. So it just allows us to be more engaged in general with digital capture. Um, great, there, there's a question on ISO standards regarding LIDAR and photogrammetry. I'm gonna take that to an email. Yes, there's already exact, uh, uh, existing NIST standards for both photogrammetry and LIDAR. They're well documented. It's more on uh, process. Uh, it is partly uh, manufacturing driven. That is also depending on your industry and how you use it. But if the panel would like to address that, that's great. If not, we have other questions to kind of see if I can plow through. Uh, we can certainly take that one to email. Um, Scott, could you share an opinion on a paradigm shift that, that you see in technology uh, and, and what are the gaps um, that are in use in between 2D and 3D? Yeah, I mean, as I think we've all kind of discussed how, you know, you've got uh, digitalization in, in, in so many industries and, and kind of the move towards uh, digital transformation. Um, I think that, uh, you know, from our perspective, I think, uh, you know, Sam's kind of like a, you know, a lot our brother, <laughs> he knows that the data is really becoming uh, the bigger issue of, of, of what we're all trying to do, because, um, you know, we went to where we were thinking with, we could start to manage in tens of gigabytes, and then we got into hundreds of uh, gigabytes. And now we recently did a, uh, a project north of Dallas, where we had four terabytes of data and 35,000 pictures. And mm -hmm. so it's, it, it's, you know, the data is starting to really, really get a lot larger. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, and, and again, to reiterate what Sam said, it, it comes down to what, we, you know, what the client needs and, uh, you know, how is it going to use it? And what we're seeing, you know, kind of roundabout way, I kind of hit you with that side of it. But where I'm going with that is, is that, you know, more and more of what, and, and you and I have just discussed this, there's more and more real time uh, data being asked for now. So it's one thing to have a big project and you've got weeks and weeks to collect the data and then deliver and, and hopefully, you know, you'll be on time, but more and more people are asking for same day or, or 24 hour data. Um, yeah. And I think that um, we're starting to look at ways that we can service that. Um, I think that that 5G, which we haven't really talked about is really going to be important. I think to all of us and especially to all the different, um, you know, sensors and, and, uh, and different methods of data collection, because right now um, there's just no uplift from the field. Uh, if you're relying on normal cell right now, you know, if you're, let's just say you're using photogrammetry to do a quick and dirty ortho mosaic. Once you get much over 15 or 20 acres, um, you're probably not going to get enough uplift that you're going to, unless you want to spend the whole day out there on a cell phone. But I think, I think with 5g though, the ability to transfer that much data to a cloud to be processed or even in the instance of visual plan to be able to go out and do a, uh, you know, do a tank, step outside the tank and have good enough cell that I can upload 145 pictures and then have that in an hour or so. Um, you know, that, that's, that's where I think the clients are really going to start to kind of, kind of increase that demand as, as that, as the uplift gets better. But that's definitely uh, one of the places that I think that there's a gap because, you know, right now, a lot of the ways we handle that is if it's something that really is that time sensitive, we'll collect the data, then right away, send a guy off to the hotel room where hopefully we've got high speed internet <laughs> and that way, but I mean, that, that's the only way you've going to do it. Right. Because yeah, you, that's true. You, just, you know, Been if there, done a, that, man. Yeah. If you, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you've got a Verizon puck or an AT&T puck, I mean, you know, I mean, you'll be out there all day. And, and well, not only that, the sending them to the hotel, sometimes you may be sending them back to a slower connection. Yeah, exactly. I, I've had challenges. I remember trying to bake point clouds from my hotel room 
numerous times and being frustrated baking all night and it's still not done yeah um, yeah i know i'm in trouble when i can't even download a, a song on spotify i figure we're not gonna be getting it. <laughs> but it, it's interesting that you say that because when you really start to look into the facility side from from the lidar perspective and i think this is one of the things that makes visual plan so uh beneficial is you know there are times when we're pushing you know 100 gig uh, of, of point cloud, we're pushing 400 gig terabytes, you know, Scott, I have a, I have a project that's 24 terabytes. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know, man. I, I, literally, it, I, went, I went to the office yesterday and there were five uh, of the mini tower boxes. Cause these guys were scavenging uh, room off the server for the next project and loading yeah. them on hard, hard disks is, you know, but, it, yeah. And the, the, the example that I like to use is, is if, if, if you want to know what it's like to move a terabyte, uh, go look to see the size of the movie that you just downloaded onto your phone and tell me how long that took. Right. Yeah, and exactly. Or go to motor vehicles to renew your license. It's the same thing. <laughs> it's a big data question. actually, you know, I, I think uh, we have another session in January that I would encourage everyone on this, uh, this meeting today to sign up for. If you go to visualplan.net to the events section, uh, we're going to be diving deep into facilities and we got some great speakers uh, from that side of the house that are going to dive deep on that. And uh, we got uh, actually got a truckload of questions we just couldn't get to today. So I'm going to take that to email, share it to the, to the, um, to the presenters. We're going to answer those and get them to everyone that was on this webinar today. And I guess I, I just uh, want to thank everyone so much, Sam, Jennifer, Scott, Kelly. Uh, what a great conversation. Appreciate you sharing your wisdom, your thoughts, your experiences. It's invaluable, those of us that learn from you as industry experts. And um, I just want to tell you how much we appreciate you on the call today. Thanks, Thank Kelly. Thanks, Thank Kelly. You. Nice to meet you all. You. Good to meet you. Thank you. Likewise.